Starbucks calls me up and great guy, you know, was on the phone and said, can I come visit you? We're, we're interested in the wellness space. Uh, and we've looked around at other juice companies and you're on the list. And I said, sure, come, come visit me. So he came down and like a couple days later, he came down to our juicery and, uh, then we went out and had dinner. Great guy. I really enjoyed the time together. And then he said to me, uh, don't be surprised if you get a call from Howard Schultz in the next couple of days. Well, the very next day, first thing in the morning, I get a call from Howard Schultz. I'm Andy Petronic, the co-founder of the Whole Life Challenge the inspirational game that helps thousands of people around the globe take action each day to improve their health, fitness, and well-being. Join me each week on the Andy Petronic Podcast for interviews with guests that will help give you ideas, get inspired, and take action toward being the best and healthiest version of yourself you can be. Hey, everybody. It is Andy Petronic, and this is episode number 142 of the Andy Petronic podcast. I My son just headed out to hop on his unicycle, which it's his second time ever trying out the unicycle, and uh, I need to get out there with him. <laughs> it's making me very nervous. But uh, I got to introduce this podcast to you guys. So I am really excited about my guest today. His name is Jimmy Rosenberg. Uh, you may not know his name. In fact, he is one of the most uh, unfindable person uh, people that I know. He doesn't have a social media account. He's not on Twitter, Facebook. Um, he is not. He's not interested in giving anybody his email address. But you probably drank one of his products at some point in your life. He is the he's he's kind of Mr. Juice. He was the founder of the Evolution Fresh Company, which is a company that was bought by Starbucks uh, about you know, a while ago. And he also started a company called Naked Juice. Um, he the the only juice company that is really well known that I know that he didn't found is called Adwala. And in um, He's been doing this for a long time. He started his first business, Naked Juice Company, in 1983 on the beach in Santa Monica. He was selling he was selling juice out of jugs. It's a crazy story. You got to hear him tell the story. Um, you know, he basically was responsible for introducing an entirely new category of drinks to the world, fresh juice. People didn't do it before before that. Um, unless they were doing it at their house and, and putting it in a blender or maybe even c centrifugal juicer. But back then, centrifugal juicers were not really even that big. Um, and as a result of his passion for quality, he continued to push the envelope on just what was capable of delivering in packaging. And that led him to the start to, to found a, another company after Naked Juice, which is called Evolution Fresh, which led him to discover, really, a an entirely new process for purifying juice that was um, purchased and then expanded upon by Starbucks once Starbucks got involved. And he's still a full on partner in that business not partner um he's the chief juice officer for evolution fresh and still is very much involved and very much engaged so uh he for the first time he actually talks about in the podcast he's never really told this story and he tells the story from the beginning of his first juice company to today where uh, starbucks has um you know really transformed the business he also gives a lot of of the non-negotiables in his life. So you'll learn about his, his smoothies and his, um, 
his meditation practice and a lot of the things that are really, really important to, to keeping and maintaining a healthy lifestyle in his life so he can continue doing what he loves to do. This is a podcast that is, uh, the, the conversation percolates, so it's slow and, but it's, it's so worth the, the, <laughs> the juice because there's a lot of juice in this story and there's a lot of lessons in this story that I think are applicable to anybody that's starting a new business. Anybody that is, that has a dream that, that, that wants to, change the world and that that believes that divine intervention is possible and wants to cultivate a practice of listening to yeah i I don't have another way of saying it but divine intervention um listening i guess intuition divine intuition and listening to that because jimmy's story really starts with that and uh, i'm not going to talk more about the podcast i'm just going to bring him in I want to remind you guys that a full set of show notes are on the podcast website at wholelifechallenge.com forward slash podcast. And uh, if you want more from me, the best way to find me is on my website. It's andypetronic.com where you can subscribe to my monthly newsletter that comes out on the first of each month. You can also see, I've, I've done about 29 YouTube videos with bodyweight workouts, and by the time this goes up, there may be more. They're bodyweight workouts that are done in under 15 minutes, and they're designed to be done without any equipment. So they're, they're, they can be done in your living room, in your, in your office. They can be done in a hotel room. They're really good for just quick, dirty, and actually pretty hard uh, training workouts. So you can find a whole index of those on my website. So check that out. So without further ado, let's bring in Mr. Juice, Jimmy Rosenberg. Enjoy. Dude, welcome. Jimmy Rosenberg, the man. I've been waiting for this. I seriously have been waiting for this. Like I've been really looking forward to this. Um, It was not easy to get it scheduled. (laughs) And then, and then it was reschedule, 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 and then. Uh, but you came out from your normal abode in deep in the heart of Topanga. Yes, and uh, I really appreciate you being here. This is uh, it's a great opportunity to just reconnect with you and um, have meaningful conversations. So thank you for having me. Yeah. No. I. I um, just so everybody else in the world knows, we know each other through uh, a school that we both went to called University of Santa Monica. And uh, we went through a two-year graduate program there for spiritual psychology. Wow. Wow. Ooh. <laughs> yeah. I don't, and yeah. Andy whatever that, whatever that class. means. <laughs> I did. I, no, nobody else knows that. I haven't shared that with anyone else in the world. We had to do a project our second year. I was blown year. away. I was like in awe. We, we we had to do a second year project and mine was to reconnect with my my musical roots because I hadn't done anything musical in a long time and I'd always had this inner passion to sing and um, I hired a vocal teacher and as it turned out we I leaned into opera <laughs> <laughs> and I belted out this this uh, operatic. Um, I don't even really remember the piece anymore. I've got a recording of it. Yeah, well, I'm not even referring to what you uh, worked on. You just stood up one day and shared in class, and somehow you started singing in front of the whole class. That's what I remember. I don't remember that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You were like, yeah. We would we would be in class, and a lot of people, and you'd be, you know, people would raise their hand if they were had some inspiration of sharing and you stood up and I think you were quite vulnerable in, in the right, moment and right. you started, you sang. Jesus, yeah. where, where was I? I mean, I don't, and I, where'd my memory of that moment yeah. go? I remember. What was your, what was your second year project? I built a meditation room in my home. Right. Yeah. That's right. Do you use it? Is it still functioning? It. Yeah, it's beautiful. Oh, cool. I go up there, I do uh 
coaching sessions, so I use it for part of my work, mm-hmm. and I meditate up there. Yeah, it's it's up on the hill, away from the house. Right. Yeah, it's right. beautiful. Cool. Cool. Well, one of the reasons I wanted you specifically on this podcast is your history with the in the juice business. Um, you're the CEO of Evolution Fresh, which is if anyone out there has ever bought a juice product from Starbucks, you've drank Jimmy's juice. Actually, I'm the I'm just to get it right. I'm the uh-huh. founder. Oh, you're not CEO. I'm not CEO. Gotcha. I'm, I'm the CJO, which is the chief juice officer. <laughs> gotcha. Okay. Yeah. I didn't actually know that. Was your does your title not say that? I think it does. It says founder on uh, your email and chief juice officer. Yeah. I think I might have just assumed that meant nope. chief. No, nope. there's other CEO. Yeah. Chief operational people and yep. CEOs, but I'm the CJO. Cool. Yeah. And so what I wanted to ask you about is this is kind of this the juice story, like how you got into this world. And it's, I mean, it's such a juice and liquids. My mom was commenting the other day, she was just here for the weekend about how much money people spend on liquids um, to drink. It's amazing, you know? And uh, you were at the start, really, of the. There weren't juices um, when you when you were first doing what you were doing. Yeah, it goes back to, uh, I want to say, 1983. Jeez, really? I didn't yeah. even know it was that long ago. Yeah. So. I mean, when you say 19, it already sounds old. Uh, <laughs> I mean, and I'm old. Yeah. So 1983, I was still in, uh, let's see, I was in high school. Yeah, 1983. Uh, just one summer, needed to figure out what to, how to make some money, and um, I got a. I was remember I was driving on the PCH, right, approaching the tunnel uh-huh. where the ten is, and the um, tunnel, yeah. I just got a little download. It's like, hey, sell juice on the beach, make and sell juice on the beach. So I said hey why not were you in the were you did you normally get divine inspiration like that around things no that was probably one of the first ones that i can remember huh because i don't know where the idea would have come from yeah i mean it just came in you weren't a juice no fanatic or you weren't you didn't you didn't grow berries in your backyard and no no i um you know I, i went to college for four or five years and started eating healthy and when i got out of the home because my parents i mean mcdonald's was fun to go to back back in the day and then but when i moved out and took care of myself it's when i became healthy and making good choices and so i did uh after a brief musical career uh with my best friends that didn't work out and then coming back to la and uh just trying to figure out what to do next. And what did you major in in college? You know, I, I didn't even finish college, so huh. I can't really even say I had a major. Huh. Did you just kind I of bounced dabble? around. I right. just, I dabbled right. and bounced around, and um, I wasn't really that into school. Mm-hmm. And was school right after high school? Like you went yeah. just right from high school to... Yeah. I think that's more normal than maybe we want to believe. Yeah. <laughs> I think people even graduate with degrees who were in the, that in that much into school. Yeah, you know? I actually had a good time. I mean, I did a a program backpacking in Hawaii. I did things like that in school. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, did your parents were your parents concerned with your seemingly? La- I mean, did you did it come across as a lack of interest, or were they concerned with your grades and were kind of on you for hey you better make make something of your life or not really huh. not really i think they trusted that i would um do something with my life so they i mean i i gave it my best shot in college it just didn't really have any interest right and uh so anyway it all worked out 
Were you uh, your music? Did you play guitar? Play I was bass? the bass guitar player in cool. the band. Cool. Yeah, with my four best friends in high school, and uh-huh. had to give it a shot, right? Right. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, it was fun, but became clear we weren't going to make money doing it. We we're just going to have fun. You weren't the next Soundgarden or... Uh... No, no. <laughs> no, we had a lot of fun doing it. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. So you had the divine... Ins- the, this. I mean, I keep saying divine. You didn't say that, but you had this thing. I think it was a... Yeah, I think it was a inner wisdom, uh-huh. divine communication of some sort saying... Go make juice. It reminds me of Field of Dreams. Have you seen Field of Dreams? Yeah, when, yeah. You know, like you get somebody whispering. You know, I can't remember what was the whisper. build it. It will build, come. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you if they build, something if you build like it, it that. will come. Right. Yeah. Right. And so, what did you do? So, um, you know, it was clear. Great. I'll make juice this summer, and I'll go down to the L.A. produce market. I don't know if you ever been down there. No. Quite a fun place. Uh, I bought. I, w- I decided I would make two drinks: strawberry banana smoothie, <clears throat> which is the original strawberry banana smoothie, and then a f- fresh pressed apple juice. So I would buy apples, and then I would buy orange oranges, strawberries, and bananas from the LA Produce Market. Get up super early, like because it's open really early, like at three, four in the morning get the fresh produce, head back to my mom's house, squeeze it, press it, put it into jugs, um, and then head head down to Venice, Santa Monica Beach, and had a backpack on my back. Had, you know, I probably went down there with six gallons worth of juice, Mm -hmm. left four of them in the car in a a cooler, Mm -hmm. And I'd walk up and down the beach with these jugs of juice with ice and cups. You poured the juice into cups? Poured (laughs) the juice into cups with ice. Put the ice in the cup first. Wow. Wow. (laughs) I can't even imagine that today. Can you imagine? (laughs) It was unbelievable. Do it for like four or five hours. I'd make a hundred bucks. What did it cost for a cup of juice? I think I charged two bucks. That's 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 not cheap. I mean, it's I'm, not like I mean, I'm guessing. I don't remember, but yeah, I'm, right. I'm thinking maybe it was about two bucks. But people loved it. Nice, a nice size, nice size, you know, like a yeah. sixteen ounce, twelve. Can you ounce imagine something. sitting on the beach and some? Yeah, it's great. Some kid with I had a full head of hair with zebra stripes. It was back in the day when Venice little hair studios were doing all kinds of cool things with people's hair. Uh-huh. Mul- Probably yeah. the beginning of that. Did you have multicolored? Yeah, it was just, I had brown hair, but then they put these zebra, <laughs> like, white stripes through my uh-huh. head. Uh-huh. So I was selling juice on the beach. I mean, it's funny because today, there'd be such resistance Oh, to yeah. anyone trusting that a kid that looked like that pouring juice out of it, God yeah. knows what would be in it. Right. Nobody, you know, like, nobody would drink it. No, no way. But people were like, you're a saint. You're, <laughs> right. I'm right. dying of thirst and you're delivering cold, fresh squeezed juice to right. my towel. Right. So anyway, it was, it was a lot of fun. Um, uh, did you have a, uh, when you were pressing juice, what did you use to press juice back then? It was, it was an, just one of the original, um, I forget the manufacturer's name, but just the apples would go through a real like kind of a grinder press. Mm-hmm. And um, then I would squeeze the orange juice on just one of those kind of One little, of those things with a crank? With not the with the crank, but just a little electric. Oh, bzz, yeah. Bzz, bzz, Yep. And then the had a little blender. So I'd take the orange juice and then put strawberries and bananas in the blender like we do today at home. And that was the strawberry banana smoothie. And um and then the fresh pressed cold pressed what they what we right. call juice today. It wasn't called cold pressed back then. 
It was just fresh squeezed. Yeah. And it was pure apple? Pure. So you had the, or- the, the orange, strawberry, Strawber- banana, and then the, the fresh apple. Yeah. That was it. Wow. Yeah. That's a, but still, that's a lot of work to press six gallons. It was a lot gallons. of work. Oh, yeah. yeah. It was a six lot. Six gallons, not a little bit of juice. Yeah, it, was, it, it made a complete mess in my mom's kitchen. But it was fun. And you'd, you'd make, what did you say, 100 bucks a day? I made 100 bucks a day. And, but you'd be working from 3 o'clock in the morning until... Yeah. until I'd probably work until 12 in the afternoon. No, more than that. Maybe 1 or 2 in the afternoon. Until I was out of juice. Right, right. And I go home and I do it again. Wow! And had and I loved it. I was, um, was probably about twenty three years old. Mm-hmm. And were you surfing at the time? Were you also spending time at the beach? And yeah, but you know, I was never a huge surfer. I I surfed, but it wasn't. It was mainly I was I was really into making juice. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. So the summer came to an end, and. Uh, I remember my dad, he actually put an article on my desk because I was living at home at the time. And there was, out of the Wall Street Journal, he put an article saying this orange juice, commercial orange juice extractor for sale. And um, anyway, I looked at it and I investigated and I decided, at that point I decided, I love making juice. I'm going to actually try to create a business out of making juice and selling it to local restaurants, local hotels, and local markets. Actually, before that, when that summer came to an end, I decided I would have a home delivery route. Hmm, So I was still making juice, I think out of my mom's kitchen and selling to neighbors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was, that's, that was the next phase. Did you bottle it instead of pouring it into yeah, cups? Yeah, that I bottled. And back then, you know, it was it like wasn't the milkman. It, it wasn't as easy as calling Amazon and getting a bunch of bottles. Like, how do you get bottles? How, are those, were those easy to come by? Um, God, you know, this is this is almost forty years ago. I got to remember how I got the bottles. Uh, wow, there was there was a company. I'm guessing here though. Yeah. Called Juice Tree and I'm pretty sure I somehow got them to sell me bottles, empty bottles. Uh-huh. And then I'd make the juice, bottle it. Yep. I think I made my own little somehow manufactured the little metal juice holder that when people signed up I would put it at their house and I would deliver it Uh into this little metal thing early in the morning. Like literally, and it stayed at their house. Yeah. So literally like the milkman used to be. Yeah. My aunt used to have a, when I was really young, used to have a box. Yeah. The milkman would come and fill, put the milk products in the box. Right. Yeah. God, those days, I I haven't thought about that in 40 years. But that was really tough, that business. Yeah. That um, people would go on vacation and it just, so I I was happy to evolve from there yeah. which was very quickly after that i think that maybe lasted three four months and then decided i would sell juice locally to restaurants hotels and supermarkets and you were still doing this out of your house out of your mom's kitchen at this point then i rented the back of a um a local restaurant called the chipper wish down in Venice. So when they were closed at night, I would go in uh, there. We'd start like at about three in the morning. Mm-hmm. We'd start juicing and be done by about seven mm-hmm. or eight. And then put our truck driver's clothes on and hat and get in our little unrefrigerated truck and deliver juice. Mm-hmm. And the restaurants were getting it in a bulk, like a bulk? Yeah, the restaurants were getting it in bulk, like in gallon jugs. Mm-hmm. So they'd have on their menu fresh squeezed orange juice, fresh grapefruit juice, maybe carrot juice. Um, Was it a custom per restaurant? Yeah, you'd call, like up, you- you'd call up for the order. My cousin, Nancy, I won't say her last name, but she, um, she would call and do the orders and... Um, uh, 
they'd say, yeah, bring me six gallons of orange juice and two gallons of grapefruit and a gallon of this and a gallon of that. And So were they, were, were they doing less blends and more like just one type of juice? Yeah, I mean, orange juice, you know, you, still today on a menu, yep. there's yep. a breakfast place. Fresh squeezed orange juice is always yep. the big one. Yep. So that was probably 80% of the sales. But in the supermarkets, that's... Orange juice was really big then as well, but that's when we started to introduce things like green vegetable juice. I mean, that was unheard of. Yeah, right. And we were doing that way back then in smoothies, and people didn't really know what it was. We had to do demos and say, yeah. you know, try this. It's how fresh and delicious taste, and it's nutritious. So we were really introducing the world of fresh squeezed juice back in the early 1980s wow. where mostly it was people understood orange juice. Yep. Uh, you know, the, the stores would, I mean, they carried Tropicana and Minute Maid, those types of things. And people grew up on that. And some people grew up squeezing their own oranges, but really the kind of the historical timeline of juice, you know, I think you know, way back then it was fresh, but very quickly it became frozen concentrate in cans, right. and then it became, right. um, you know, not from concentrate. Right. And right. Minute Maid, you know, put the little straw in the orange, and it was like not from concentrate. Right. And so there was really a historical timeline um, that I've been associated with about the kind of different levels, the different platforms of juice, how mm -hmm. it's grown through the years and, you know, all the way up to today. I mean, cold pressed was, you know, the latest thing that we started, Evolution Fresh. Um, it, so I don't know about you, but preparing for meals can be a chore. Deciding where to go for lunch, what food I need to buy for meals, what I'm going to eat for lunch or for dinner, planning my menus. Well, look, I just don't do it. I mean, very often when left to my own devices, I end up going out. And if I'm really hungry and I don't have anything to eat in the house, I can easily be tempted to go to a place that's not so good for me. So it was like a godsend when I first got my meals delivered to me from the good kitchen. I mean, it was like angel singing, like, Oh my gosh, they solved this decision-making pro pro problem that I've always had around, around uh, you know, food, especially at lunchtime. So I get five meals delivered a week. They come to me in a FedEx container. Um, they're cold. They keep in my refrigerator for two weeks. And they're delicious. They're whole life challenge compliant. They're paleo or keto or vegetarian. And you know what? I highly recommend you give them a shot. If you've never done it before, you get 15% off your first order. You can use this link, thegoodkitchen.com forward slash WLC. Check them out. Like juice combining was not something people did really back then. No, like you didn't not, see a strawberry, banana, no, orange, no. especially not available in the supermarket. No, you could, if you went to a health food store, mm -hmm. you could, some of them had a juice bar and you can get like a carrot juice. Um, were they using centrifugal juicers back then or were they? Yeah, there was, there was a centrifugal juice machine that they were, they were using. And is that what you used? Um, no, we would, uh, very quickly on, we were doing a, a hydraulic press huh. that we built ourselves. Really? Yeah. How did you know to do that? Uh, not sure how I stumbled across that concept, but it was, you know, it was a few people putting their ideas together and hiring some type of engineer guy that said, oh yeah, we can put a piston and, you know, a motor and, you know, get uh, some boards and put the juice and wrap it in a cheesecloth and the thing will go up and down and press the juice out of it. And I'm like, that will work. And it does it did it just literally just yeah just go up very slowly not yeah, as fast yeah, yeah. It, yeah. you know literally like dun, 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 
I mean, really slowly. So like the Star Wars trash compactor. Yeah. Like that slow yeah. moving. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that's how we made a lot of the pressed juices. And those are what juices do you press? What what fruits or Well, yeah, there's really three ways to make juice. There's pressing, which is basically would be you take vegetables and you grind up the pulp. You make it into a pulp and then you press the pulp. Oh. Right? So you press the juice out of the pulp so <clears throat> the fiber gets left behind. Uh-huh. And then there's – that's one method. So basically vegetables. We used to make coconut milk you know, out of – pulp like pineapple apples why do you need to turn it to pulp first before you press because you wouldn't really get any think i mean if you just put a carrot in a press you're i don't even know that it would work if you would be able to get the juice the juice the the uh, making it into a pulp like kind of chopping it up into very very small pieces just makes it more um you know, as you're pressing it, 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 you can extract juice way easier than if it's yep. bigger pieces. So the smaller the pieces, the more juice you get out of it. Huh. Interesting. So, okay. yeah, three. It's you like know, squeezing so, blood out of a turnip. It doesn't work. But if you chop the turnip up, yeah. maybe you can squeeze blood out of a turnip. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so that's pressing. And then there's like citrus extraction, which we did a lot of which is taking you know, a special machine to squeeze the inside of the pulp of the orange. So you take it out of the, you have to, you have to peel it first. Well, you don't peel it, but the machine itself would kind of slice the orange in half and oh. just ream the inside of it. Like the handheld ones, kind but, of, but, autom- yeah. more, but, but more, more automatic. Automated. Yeah. Uh-huh. So we would do that with citrus, you know, whether it was orange tangerine lemon lime grapefruit Mm -hmm. um and then the last method basically was a smoothie making machine so we just had large blenders like we all have at home Mm -hmm. a blender but we had a large one this is before the days of vitamix or or blendtec yeah and so did they spin fast enough did the motors burn up did the did did the uh yeah, Were they there mechanical issues. I mean, these weren't. Yeah, these weren't that sophisticated. So, but they were commercial. Um, they weren't used for this application, but we applied yep. juice blending to it, and it worked. Right. So right. yeah, we had uh, we had all kinds of different engineering challenges and ways to grow the business and make more juice and keep the quality. You know, not um, diminish quality at all. So that was that was always the ongoing challenge: how to make more juice and keep it nutritionally and you know authentic taste quality pure. Right. And when you were so, was your primary customer supermarkets or was it businesses? It was a mixture of restaurants, hotels, and supermarkets. Okay. Yeah. And were you yet? packaging in little individual containers for people or were you yeah the supermarket business that's what we did for them we did maybe half gallon jugs of orange juice but then the 16 ounce single serve Mm -hmm. unit of measure what was it called well the very first company was called you like juice company (laughs) with a u with a u (laughs) And was that on the label? Like, did you have a that label was on that the was, label. you like juice? You like juice. So, but that only probably was for a year. And then it became, you like juice companies, Naked Juice. Ah. Oh. So I'm the founder of Naked Juice as well. Right. And um, that was very controversial. Which part? The name, Naked Juice. Why? People were like, you cannot call a company naked on the label today i don't think there'd be a today it would not matter but we're going back to the early 1980s and um they're like hey the supermarkets are they gonna but i'm like it's almost like it's almost like maybe back then it was thought of like porn maybe you know like but i loved the name yeah uh naked to me just represented 
unadulterated, pure, uh-huh. simple. He used to hang out naked anyway. Did you come up with the name? You know, we we had a I think we were in a music session one night and there was um there was some friends all together and somehow the name naked came up in the conversation and uh, and then one thing led to the other and by the end of that evening it was I decided we were gonna call this company Naked Juice. Wow. So there you go. Was your was your wife had you already met your wife at this time or was this before my wife is French and she was visiting um Venice Beach and so I did meet her. She wasn't my girlfriend, she was my friend's girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And then she went back to France for oh, well, I, I I didn't see her for 7 years and then Oh wow. We, so she wasn't involved in the beginning of the business. This she, is you, you hired your cousin, obviously, and you yeah, had exactly. other family members. Yeah, right. And I had a partner as well. Oh, okay. I had a best friend partner. <clears throat> yeah. So, okay. So now you're big enough. Are you still in the that? Well, rest, we're, are we we're, still in the kitchen of that restaurant? No, um, no, 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 no. Um, it went from the kitchen to another space in Venice to maybe another space in Venice, and then finally we rented a fairly. Um, Decent facility in South Central LA. Ah, okay. Yeah. And that's when Naked Juice started to happen. We were doing a lot of uh, a lot of restaurants, a lot of demoing, just you know, growing with this new concept of fresh juice, and people were starting to get acquainted with it and appreciating it, and more and more uh, supermarket buyers were you know supermarket buyers are always interested in innovation and mm. new and exciting and yeah yeah julia just mentioned actually she because we have we have help at the house we have a lady that comes to our house two days a week and she, we usually she usually does our grocery shopping and you know the stuff that that um we don't necessarily have to do and uh uh, Julie went to Trader Joe's the other day and she's like, God, I miss going to the grocery store. There's so much cool new stuff. Oh yeah. You know, yeah. new, there's new bars and there's new, you know, we, she brought home a date, uh, some sort of a, cause we're always trying to come up with creative ways to feed my son that are healthy. And yeah. so she found another bar that he could try. And that's just stuff you can't, you can't tell somebody to get when you don't even know it exists. Yeah, exactly. If you, so, yeah. if you, stop going to the supermarket or the farmer's markets or, you know, the health food stores. Six months later, there's always amazing innovation happening. Yeah. So when you're in a food company, if you're not innovating ferociously and at at a fast pace, you will fall behind Hmm. very quickly. Wow. Yeah. Hmm. So your innovations came by way of new flavors or? Yeah, we were always just um, looking around and visiting. I mean, luckily we're in Southern California and we're in the mecca of really that health food and wellness um, where it where creativity really home bases. Mm-hmm. So you don't have to look far to be inspired. You know, there's juice bars and health food stores and all kinds of businesses. And truth is people get ideas from other people. And, and, um, so I was always looking around whether the idea came from me or, you know, was a, an offshoot of what someone else was doing. Mm -hmm. Uh, it it was all of the above, Mm -hmm. but yeah, yeah. Always had to be innovating. So naked juice was, uh, you know, we were opening more and more stores and they were as, like naked juice stores. Were, no, no. We were opening more. We were getting into more of the, the supermarket oh, chains. Gotcha. Gotcha. And, um, and they would give us more and more space. If stuff sells, right. they give you space. They're yeah, in right. the, they're in the, the business of selling 
selling per, selling per what square sells, per right? per so, square inch. Yeah, that's what they look like. Oh, really? Look at what is selling in our store. Uh huh. And we need to. So anyway, Naked Juice was doing quite well, and um, we would be do a lot of demos. I love doing demos in the store. You in go stores, and, so yeah, you get to yeah. talk to people and educate them and mm-hmm. give them samples. And you know, the juice was so good; it was so fresh, so good, so nutritious. Uh, you know, just tasted. Did 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 it have a shelf life no oh, longer yeah. than twenty four hours? Like it was. You a- know, in the beginning, it had maybe a three day shelf life, but as we became, um, as we learned more how to manufacture properly under refrigeration and clean conditions and the trucks became refrigerated and you know just things evolved Mm -hmm. and then eventually we bought technologies of ways to extend shelf life uh, that were respected in the industry and then we today we have like a 50 60 day code life on juice wow yeah wow and it's done with really without compromising the quality of the product at all wow but that's jumping ahead a little bit in yeah, the right. in the his- history of this but yeah naked juice that was a seven year run for me did it was it mostly southern california or had it spread it, did it did you expand out uh we did it was mostly Southern California. Maybe at the end we had expanded to Northern California as well. So, but we ran our own trucks. It was a, it was really a, uh, you know, a small, growing, rapidly growing. We had our own distribution system where we deliver the product. We'd make it, and we deliver it. Mm-hmm. So we you we, control we, all we parts. controlled it. Yeah, right. So I didn't ever want somebody else to do our manufacturing. It was just, I was so into, it was so important, the quality level of the product. And I felt like I'm, you know, I kind of like see myself as a, I'm I'm so passionate about the quality. It's like a super fine chef in a restaurant. They Mm -hmm. just have their hands all over it. Yeah. Just because they want it. It's, they want to, they're passionate about the quality. Yeah. That's, that's, that's what I was like. Right. What, were you equipped to like in terms of experience to know how you were doing? Like, how did you know how to do all this? No idea. how. <laughs> <laughs> Never took a business course. I didn't finish college. Right. So it was learn as you go. <laughs> I mean, this was before, let's see, I'm trying to think back. This was before even a Mac came out. Oh, like yeah. this is uh, there were no computers, so no spreadsheets or Excel or, QuickBooks or any of that stuff. <laughs> no. Did you hire people that that helped you understand cash flow and were were there any cash flow points where you almost didn't make it? Did you what were some of the what were some of the hurdles you had to overcome? Yeah, I mean luckily a few years in we did hire one guy that um did know uh more of the business cash flow accounting side of it. So that wasn't my expertise. So we did bring in somebody that that became their expertise and that was very helpful. Um, But I mean, really because it was, it was, it was a product that um, was in demand and successful we were making enough money to fund our growth. Right. Which is, you know, today it's usually have to take on investment. Yep. A lot of investment. Yep. Back then there wasn't as much competition because we were first to market. Yep. And um and we were we weren't spending a lot of money. All of our money was on kind of equipment and the plant and but back then you didn't spend crazy marketing dollars. Yeah, you did demos, but you know, your own your own people were doing it. But there was there was plenty of hurdles in figuring out how to make larger quantities of juice and not compromise quality at all. But sure, you had to buy 
as you grew, you had to buy more trucks. Yeah. And, um, but because we were first to market with not much competition, we had enough dollars per drop per account to really be making money and funding the growth. We didn't mm-hmm. make a lot of money, but we made enough to grow. Right. Slow right. growth. Were you paying yourself all through this? And we were, this is how we lived. Huh. Right. Uh, I paid myself. Right. Paid, you know, everybody that worked for the company. We, you know, we had a successful business that was funding people's lives. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Was there a point, were there any points that you can remember in that first business that was like, were catastrophic or obviously not catastrophic because you wouldn't be, you wouldn't have made it, but, or any missteps that were notable that you remember like, oh God, that was almost, you know, almost killed us. Yeah. I mean, the the biggest hurdles or events that occurred were usually when a product would go bad, uh, you know, something happened in the manufacturing of it or the, sh- it didn't really go bad, like microbiologically, like make people sick. But because I was such a quality fanatic, I'd be like that taste is off Hmm. we need to pull it all off the shelves and it would cost a certain amount of money to do that but i was happy to do it and it's kind of like when i look back it's it's how people gained trust Hmm. like the buyers would Hmm. gain trust and said you know this this guy jimmy not only does he have a great product, but he has a lot of integrity on his product. Right. Where today, if you make mistakes and need to pull product off the shelf, it's not looked at very well. Right. Uh, back then, it actually was looked as That's a like good high integrity. Yeah, right. Where right. today is, there's not much tolerance for making mistakes. Right. How, how would you know you made a mistake? Like, would you go into a store and sample what's on the shelf? Or would you taste the bat? If you t- tasted the batch, you would already know before it went out. We had retained samples, ah, and I would ah. be out at the stores all the time tasting. So right. sometimes you don't catch it, but uh, through your retained samples and tasting at stores because you're doing demos all the time, you're you're tasting, and it was a small enough business where. And people, we knew we were, we just, our, we had a distributor in San Diego and he would taste all the time and we would just get alerted. It's like, hey, yeah. try this. This batch tastes a little off. And I'd taste it and I'd go, you know what? It is a little off. Let's, so hmm. we had control. I mean, yeah. today, you know, it's a national company. Yeah. And um, to do a recall, that's a, bad word you know i I don't even want to bring that up (laughs) okay we don't have to talk about that (laughs) yeah you're you're you look like you might like start sweating and you know (laughs) that's today it's food businesses that's that's you don't want to go there right so uh at the end of this run with naked juice did you uh did you sell it did you yeah what happened was so you know over the seven years we we're growing, growing, growing. And um, one day I got a call from Jaquita Banana because we were sending some product out to Cincinnati for something and the the son of the owner of Jaquita Banana, who was my age and was into healthy living, mm-hmm. called me and said, wow, I just tried your juice. It's like amazing stuff. Mm-hmm. Can I come see you? said, sure. So he came out. um, He basically took out his checkbook and wrote me a million dollar check. Wow. And I said, no, thank you. And he says, you know, he was like, okay, well, I'm going to come back next year and see how you're doing. I mean, I left out a few details, but... um, so he came back a year later, and at that time, you know, it's interesting. The the kind of the larger you grow, usually 
more needs for cash and yep. uh we needed money and um so you needed money to grow we needed, needed money, money to for, grow for advertising yeah for, just for marketing and more trucks and yep. more equipment and a bigger plant and yep. you know we just needed money mm-hmm. um it's just the way it works with when people have a successful product they need money to grow otherwise yeah, right. you know you either grow or you kind of die yep and to grow you need money so anyway he came and we worked out a deal and he basically said to me and i still remember the line you know i'm here just to fund your dreams we want you to dream and continue what you're doing and we're going to fund it so it was about 6 months in to the deal where their accounting people said you're not making enough money. Profit. Yeah, you're not making enough profit. Right. Like we're we're never going to get to where we want to get to with this. So funding the deal, did that mean you gave away a piece of the company? I did. Oh, you did. Okay. I, did. I think I gave away 49% of it. Oh, okay. And um, they said to me, we need to lower our costs. Let's try using some pre-processed ingredients. Well, I didn't even know what that meant because basically all we did was buy raw produce and make it into juice. That yep. was That's what we did. Yep. And um, they said, for example, we could use Chiquita Banana has a banana processing facility where we make banana puree. We take fresh bananas, we peel them, we pasteurize them, and I didn't even know really what that what the word meant, and then we can it, and then we sell it. Well, we could lower our cost in like strawberry banana smoothie and our smoothies that you're using bananas in, we can lower the cost from, mm-hmm. I'm just making this up, a dollar a pound to 50 cents a pound. Yep. And I said, Let's, let me taste what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. So I tasted their banana puree versus our fresh peeled banana. And I'm like, that banana puree is horrible. You know, it tastes like cooked <laughs> baby food. Yeah. And um and it makes the drinks taste terrible. There's no way I'm willing to do that. And I started to investigate what like pasteurized heating something, what it does to certain nutrients. And mm-hmm. so I was not willing to make that compromise either. Yeah. So we started to butt heads. Yeah. It's like, well, you can't they were saying you can't continue on at this profit margins. Mm-hmm. Uh, we need to do something. You're not willing to um, compromise ingredient quality to lower your cost of goods. We're kind of at an impasse here. So anyway, long story short, uh, I decided to leave. Hmm. They bought the rest of the company. So they had all the rights. I mean, they owned it. They own the brand Naked Juice now. Mm -hmm. And um, I had a two-year non-compete, and I went into the the lettuce farming business. I had a company called Growing Up Organic, where we just made organic. um, We were growing lettuces, and then we would wash it. It's kind of like the very beginning of pre-washed lettuce that you oh, buy yeah. in the pack. In the bags, yeah. This was at the very, very beginning of that. Hmm. And I saw it as a good idea. Gang, I am so appreciative of you guys being my audience, but I am also in the business of growing this podcast because I want to get the message out. I want to get these stories out to more, more and more people. And the only way I can do that is with your help. Word of mouth is huge. So if you hear something in this podcast, you've heard something in this podcast that you think somebody that you know would relate to, stop the recording right now and shoot them a text, shoot them an email, send them a link to the podcast and say, check this out. If you're super motivated and you want to leave a review, go to this link, bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash Andy Petronic podcast. And you can go into iTunes and the, the ratings and reviews section and leave a review. That helps get the podcast seen by lots more people. The more we get of those, the more people we get to see this thing, the more guests I can get on this podcast that have greater influence in the world. And the more 
more people can be affected by these incredibly powerful stories. So I appreciate your help. I appreciate you listening. And thanks in advance for spreading the word. Was that a hard decision to make? I mean, I, I feel like, like I think about my business and the whole yeah. like challenge and I think, God, that, that would be like ripping my heart out if suddenly somebody said, well, you should really allow people to drink sodas, you know, like, look, okay, I know you're, you know, we're going to mod like take, taking that ingredient. That's, that's the, that's the heart of the business. Yeah. Like ripping that out and then seeing your name on this product that's out on this thing. That's not how it. How did you do that? Yeah, it was, uh, I, I mean, seven, eight years have gone by of building this business and I was 29 years old and, uh, I don't know, I felt a lot of heavy weight on my shoulders, just running it and financial responsibility as well, the pride and the inspiration of building it. and But I think when they, and then we were butting heads and it just started not to feel good and hmm. and I wasn't really, I had a partner now and I, you know, they were, it, it just, somehow I let go. Hmm. I uh, I said, okay, um, I'm, I'm going to walk away. So, yes, it was and my the money, baby. I'm sure, the money, I'm sure, helped. The money helped. Yeah. Uh, I was happy to have the money. I mean... Can you disclose how much that was? Uh, I think it was like... I think it was about a four to five million dollar deal and that, back then. Back then, that's <clears throat> a huge... Yeah. And then, you know, it didn't all go to me. But right, um, right. it was enough to have money for a few years and treat everybody to everything. I mean, because, right. you know, when right. you're that age and you have that kind of money, it's That's like, what you, do. Right. you know, you just, you just share it. <laughs> right. And, um, and I did buy my home in Topanga. Uh, but I got to tell you very quickly, the money ran out, hmm. you know, so it wasn't like I was set for life at all. Right. And, um, so yeah, I moved, I moved on. Naked mm -hmm. Juice became, I mean, I was really proud of what I did and accomplished, and uh, but I did move on and uh, had this next business. And then, like I was, yeah, but you asked, was it difficult? Yeah, there was, I mean, it, it was, it, the, the kind of the divorce was, was difficult. Yeah. But at the same time, I was, somehow I was okay with it as well. You know, I, I didn't um, dwell on it for very long at all. I moved on. W would you make the same decision today? Do you think that was a good choice? Well, I did sell Evolution Fresh. Right. I happened to work for the company, so. Right. Uh, so you ha almost have made the same decision. Yeah. You gotta, I mean, right. different, yeah, different time for different reasons, different opportunities. Right. So, well, we got to I mean, jump. We got to jump into Evolution Fresh. Yeah, we're uh, gonna we're gonna jump ahead. I got I got to stay attuned. I got a there's a clock right over your head because I I know you're you've got a strict end time. Yeah. So uh, I want to I don't want to leave any parts of these stories out. But I yeah it, I'm I feel like I'm squeezing them like <laughs> juice. <laughs> <laughs> They're really rich. Yeah. I mean, it's a great story. It's so compelling and such 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 a part of your soul you know yeah. like it's it's really really cool so so how what happened uh to get you from the lettuce business growing up the, organic yeah. Yeah. so i had a two-year non-compete i'm sitting on the sidelines watching chiquita kind of i mean i you know, kind of, I would say, ruin the quality of the product. Yep. And, you know, at the same time, what was happening in Northern California was this company called Odwalla. So Naked Juice was the Southern California company. Odwalla was the Northern California company. Great guy, Greg, who was the owner of that company, was 
growing Odwalla as I was growing naked. Hmm. And, um, but he sold also to Coke. Hmm. And um, so when I'm sitting on the sidelines, I'm kind of seeing, you know, these two great raw juice companies, brands kind of deteriorate because they're now both pasteurized juice companies, right. longer shelf life, yep. you know, less authentic taste quality, less nutrient dense products, but longer shelf life, get to share it with more of, you know, longer shelf life means you can distribute it to f- further and further f- away from your manufacturing facility and right. becomes a national product. So obviously Naked Juice went on to be very successful and Odwalla went on to be very successful and um, just wasn't my thing. Mm-hmm. I I wanted, I didn't really care how big it was. I just wanted quality. Yep. That's what made me tick yeah so it just didn't work for me anymore and um so watching watching them grow but from being a compromise in my mind product sure on a lot of their minds it wasn't compromise at all it was the perfect product to grow and share nationally but from my perspective compromise product i wanted to jump back in i saw opportunity again let's make a fresh squeezed raw juice. Hmm. So I, as soon as my non-compete ended, the, literally the day it ended, even though I love doing the farming thing and I have a tremendous respect for farmers because farming is just unbelievable to organically farm something. Yeah. It's, it's, I mean, you got to have the love and the passion for the land and growing and yep very appreciative for what goes on out there in the farming community. It's, it's funny, as you were talking about your first story popped into my head, your, your story is very similar to the uh, McDonald's brothers and Ray Kroc. Um, you being more like the McDonald's brothers and Mc, and uh, Ray Kroc being more like what um, Chiquita kind of did. Yeah. So I watched that movie. It's a good, really good movie, but it sounds very similar. Yeah, yeah. Except the McDonald's brothers didn't get back into the business. I got back in it. Right. So the day it ended started Evolution Fresh. It was then, it was called Evolution, and we added on Evolution Fresh. It's been 25 years since Evolution Fresh was born. And it was born with the same uh, enthusiasm and inspiration and uh, values that the original Naked Juice was born with. So mm-hmm. here I come again, just making raw, fresh juice and want, you know, being so passionate about authentic taste, quality, and nutrient density. Mm-hmm. So that's what we did for some years. But then there are some things that happened. There's, you asked, like, was there some big events? Well, a huge event was what happened at Odwalla, a baby died. So they were making raw juice. They made apple juice uh, and a baby died from E. coli poisoning. Wow. So that changed the whole fresh juice industry. The FDA jumped in and mandated rules saying you can no longer make raw fresh juice. If you're a company that's distributing from your we call it a juicery from our juicery out to supermarkets. You can have a juice bar that yeah, you can right, go in and get right. fresh juice. So all of a sudden, here I am being passionate about making raw fresh juice, and the FDA comes in and says, you can't make raw fresh juice anymore. How, how far into Evolution Fresh was this? How many years in? You know, it was only a few years in. Okay. So... And we had to get resourceful and creative and figure out what we're going to do. And so, for, yes, for a f- for some years, we became a flash pasteurized juice company, huh. where we were still peeling our own bananas. And but the the last process in the step, we had to run it through a pasteurizer, which is basically you heat the juice up to a certain temperature for a certain amount of time, and it kills let's call it bad bacteria, bad pathogens. It's not boiling. It's like one, isn't it like 156 or something? Yeah, it's not boiling. Boiling is like above 212 degrees. So this is not boiling, 
but it's still hot enough to kill these like E. coli yep. or salmonella. Um, Did you do that in large batches or in the in the large bottles? Large batches. Large batches. Yeah, and back, then you then you bottle it. Back then it was done, yeah. Pasteurize in large batches large batches, then bottle it mm-hmm. and then distribute it. So there was other companies that took the opportunity to really get like a 90-day code life. We went from probably a 10-day code life of fresh juice to maybe this gave us 20 days the way we were doing it because we were still doing it the freshest way possible. Mm-hmm. Anyway, Evolution grew and this was our brand. And uh, and then... You were competing with Odwalla and with, with Naked, Naked Juice. Oh, yeah. Right, they yeah. were huge competitors of ours. Right. So the next big event was uh, I was actually in a meeting with a Costco buyer and you know the guy looked at me and says, you know, as passionate as and crazy as you are about freshness, we're buying a guacamole from a supplier that uses this technology called high pressure processing. And you should look into it because it, it, kills the pathogens most of them without heating the product so it doesn't affect the taste quality and it doesn't really affect uh, the nutrient density of the product Hmm. so anyway long story short I went out and went to the manufacturer bought a bunch of our raw juices before we pasteurized and went for the step of pasteurization, I brought some of our raw juices, like our orange juice and our green vegetable juice and our watermelon juice and carrot juice, brought it up, ran it through their machine, tasted it, and I couldn't tell the difference. Wow. You know, they blind taste tested me. I couldn't tell the difference. And I'm like, whoa. And they were saying, maybe, because they didn't have experience with juice, they said, maybe you'll go from maybe a 15-day code to a 45 day code shelf life. Wow. And I'm like, so. Wait, 15 days with flash pasteurization? 15 to 20. And so would you have to do the flash pasteurization with their process or you'd, no. n- you'd be able to skip that? We'd be able to skip it. And, and triple potentially yeah. your shelf life. Well, and let's remember we were choosing to flash pasteurize a certain way that kept as close as we could intact. Yeah. the authentic taste quality and the nutrient density. There was other people heating it really hot for a long period of time that would get 90-day code life. Right, right. You just chose like not to do that. Naked Juice and Odwalla. Right. Um, we chose not to do it because we were still trying to do the best we could given the rules the FDA put in place. Mm-hmm. Um, so anyway, I was like, Wow. This thing tastes as good as raw juice. It's not going to impact the nutrient density of the product like pasteurization does. Mm -hmm. And we can have 45-day code life. I mean, that means we can pretty much become a national juice company out of our juice juicery in Southern California. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I decided we're doing this. We're going to buy one of these three million dollar machines wow and we're going to go from a little local company to a bigger company so i had to raise i think like somewhere 12 million bucks you know which was huge for me i never did any of this and knew about this kind of thing um so we did it and we we took this machine it took us about a year to figure it out and kind of convert from I was telling you about the kind of the historical timeline of juice going from frozen concentrate to pasteurized to flash pasteurized. Now what we were embarking on was this whole new category mm-hmm. that we decided to call cold pressed. Hmm. And nobody knew what that was. Did the FDA had they blessed it before nope. you before you invested all this money? No. They didn't bless it, but we did enough research. Their rule was you had to be able to kill this certain pathogen, Mm -hmm. E. coli and salmonella. And 
we did some tests through this high pressure process. Luckily enough, through the pressure, the way this machine works, it kills those pathogens Mm -hmm. without having other negative effects on the product. Is it just pressure? Just pressure. It's like basically if you took a bottle of juice and you swam to the bottom of the ocean, Uh that amount of pressure, uh, you know, without getting too technical here, that pressure kind of deactivates these certain bad bacterias. Hmm. And amazingly works. Wow. It's expensive, but... It, it, is it like a big empty chamber? It's a big empty chamber that gets flooded with water. The bottle of juice, the finished package bottle of juice goes into it. Oh. And it does its thing inside this does it chamber. Does s- stack up a whole bunch of them? Yeah, you put a whole bunch of them in there. Uh-huh. And it, through the pressure built, because what it's happening is you're pumping in more water than this chamber can hold so yeah. pressure's building and it just works wow and um, what's the what's the pressure just out of curiosity that it builds up to inside crazy there? amount it's like eighty thousands. <laughs> forget the measurement eighty thousand pounds of pressure wow yeah wow so those little bugs just don't they Can't don't survive, survive it. They just they yeah. Just, they sorry. don't survive it. Yeah. Um, so here we are. We're like, okay, we have this new technology. People don't understand it. It's better than pasteurization because pasteurization basically you're forced to use natural flavors mm-hmm. because heating juice changes the taste of right. it. Right. Right. And. Um, we didn't heat it to that extent, but basically, if you really want to be a national juice company, you got to heat it up. You're going to have to use natural flavors. The nutrient density is going to get diminished. Now, we talk a second about natural flavors. Are those chemical additives that, that bring the flavors back in? Like, what are those? Natural flavors are basically made in the lab, mm-hmm. right? Uh it's flavor companies kind of there's like there's unnatural flavors and there's natural flavors and there's there's controversy of exactly what it is but yeah. from my perspective i never wanted to use a kind of a processed flavor because to me uh i could taste it tasted like a processed flavor. It didn't taste yeah. like a blueberry tastes like a blueberry. A blueberry natural flavor, to me, tastes completely different. It tastes like blueberry natural flavor, which isn't my definition of, I use the word authentic taste quality. Yeah. Um, you know, my kind of definition of quality is it has to have two things, authentic taste quality and nutrient density. Right. And using a natural flavor is not my definition of quality. Yeah. So I always was challenged to come up with great tasting beverages that had authentic taste quality, not using a natural flavor. Right. Yeah, because I think right now about, uh, we're just talking about this at a party, uh, LaCroix, and how they have, they don't have natural flavors. It says like essence, flavor yeah. essence, and nobody knows what it is. And they're very vague about what it is. And uh, is that natural? Is it not natural? Is it, you know, who? Yeah, I would I flavor know. essence. I mean, it depends. I'm not really sure. It could be the oils from the peel. So it's, oh, it's, it's yeah. a gray area. Yeah. Whether they're saying essence or natural flavors. Bottom line is, you know, we're not using that. We're yeah. only using the the raw fruit or vegetable mm-hmm. um, to... And this process allowed you to do that. You didn't have to use yeah, anything it, else to... it didn't diminish, like pasteurization diminished the, the authentic taste quality of it where you were forced to use a natural flavor. Now, to be a national company and be able to keep up with supply, I mean, with demand, how, did, how many of these machines did you have to buy? And how how long did it take each batch to go through this process? 
It was, it was, I mean, we had one machine to begin, mm -hmm. you know, now we have multiple machines, but, um, I mean, the one machine, we did pretty good. I mean, we had, we had a lot of volume using this one machine. That was just the last step. It's, you know, more difficult. The other parts are more difficult. The other parts, sourcing the raw produce at the farms and yep. bringing it into the plant within two or three days and, you know, moving through the plant in 48 hours and, you know, the different ways of extracting juice and mm -hmm. pressing, blending. So cold, that's really interesting. Cold press has nothing to do with juicing. It has to do with the process of eliminating the uh, microbes. Or the There's not one definition for huh. cold pressed. Uh, the evolution fresh definition of cold pressed is our whole process. E everything so from the, all of it. The fruit comes into the factory and then you do all of it together. Got it. So everybody has their own little definition, but really, uh, under the kind of the umbrella or the halo of cold pressed, I would say people are using the term ethically if they're not heating it in any way. Right. You know, no right. pasteurization, no flash pasteurization. Uh, you know, it's more like a fresh squeezed process. Right. For us, it's, you know, it's working with the farms. It's literally our kale. It's harvested. And within 48 hours, it's in our production, in our juicery. Wow. And within another 48 hours, it goes... It's pressed, bottled, high pressure processed, and out the door. Wow. So that's four what, days from farm to out the door. Yeah, I mean, you know, four to six days yeah. from from harvest to out the door. Wow. It's pretty amazing. Yeah, it is. Uh, I'm blown away by it. I'm just I mean, I've seen it over thirty five years and you would think quality would get compromised at some point mm -hmm. as you get, but it's gotten better wow. and better and better. Was this a transformative event? Uh, this cold, this process, this, this pressure process that you used and, and were you able to patent it and, we and weren't, keep it, other people from using it or yeah. no, we didn't patent it, but it was, uh, it was revolutionary. Uh -huh. I mean, it was, a new way of making juice. So nobody understood it. Uh, or, you know, so kind of creating a new, uh, what would I call it? Creating a new, um, hmm, just a new, not a new brand, but a new way of a new, uh, I'm forgetting the word that I want to use. Like paradigm but, or no, or? just a, like a new category of juice okay. from, frozen concentrate to concentrate to pasteurize to right. flash pasteurize there hadn't been an event for 25 years really flash pasteurize naked odwala created a flash pasteurized you know the that's that was super premium juice at the yep. point that was the best we just raised the bar with mm -hmm. cold press juice right but nobody knew what it was right so we had to go out and the buyers at the markets were like bring it on we love innovation hmm. We're going to support you, but to teach and to educate, we're still doing it. Yeah. You know, pe people today think Naked Juice is still the best. And we're like, is no. Naked Juice and Odwala one company now? No, no, one's well, owned. One, one's owned by Coke and one's owned by Pepsi today. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, interesting. So, generally speaking, everything ends up being the. Yeah. I mean, the water, whatever. Yeah, it is. there's right. so many companies owned by those two companies, but. Uh, Now, are you still the only juice company that is no. doing it this way? No, no, no. What? Every good idea gets copied very quickly. Right. So, I would say it took it took us a year just to figure out how to use it, and then it took another year for probably people to take notice of it, and then 
there was this new category being developed called cold pressed and it was starting to gain some momentum and that's when some other companies jumped in so there there is a category now called cold pressed juice and it's you know it's the one that cost more than Naked and Odwala and Bolt Yeah, I was going to say, did, were you able to keep your cost down? But it, or it added, obviously, it added cost. It added cost. I yeah. mean, it's a more expensive way to do it. And it's yeah. generally the people that are doing cold press juice are also organic. Yeah. So it's not only today Evolution Fresh is mostly organic mm-hmm. and cold pressed and definitely is a premium price. Right. Although because of our volume, uh, we've been able to bring the price down like, some years ago, it was more. The average price was probably seven ninety nine for a pint. Now the average price is three ninety nine, hmm. which is amazing. That and is it's amazing, just, yeah. and it's not. There's no compromise of quality. The quality has gotten better and better. It's just there's no middlemen, right, from us in the farm anymore. And um, so, if I go to a juice place and get a cold pressed juice. It has nothing to do with the process. That's just fresh juice out of a press or a centrifugal juicer or or, or there's or it's whatever the guy decides that means. It's not it even. Is. It doesn't even make. It doesn't mean anything really. Well, it does. It should. It should mean that it's done without pasteurization. Yeah, but I mean, if it's a juice bar, if they're not going to pasteur. I mean, they're right, not going to heat right, the juice. Exactly. Bar. They spin a it in a centrifugal juice bars, or you can call it cold press. You can call it fresh juice. But usually they call it cold press. Now, some of them would say that cold pressing is a method of extraction. Yeah. You know, it's a, it's a like more of a hydraulic. It's not a centrifugal. Yeah. But everybody has their own little probably particulars of that definition of cold press, but it's right. become a category. Right, right. So seven years ago, you know, into this journey, seven years, Starbucks approached me. I'm sure you want to get to this. I don't know how much time we have left. Well, here's, here's what I was thinking. So it's, we got about two minutes until you got to go. <laughs> it went like that, right? Oh God. So um, uh, I would love to put you on the spot to get back on a phone call or a Zoom chat yeah. and add the Let's next part of the story. Because I, I want to do that, but I also want to get a little bit more insight as to how you live your life. Yeah. Because I think that's another important piece of the story. And, Let's do it. And um, is this a good place to break? Yeah, and then I we think can... so. We almost got to the part of Evolution Fresh where Starbucks bought the company. Yeah. And... Um, has really the partnership has been incredible, and we got to build a, you know, the state of the art cold press juicery in the world. Yeah, no, I yeah, let's just stop because so, I can't wait to go yeah. into this, and it's yeah, it's important. Yeah. So uh, see, that's why that's why these stories can't, you know, like it's funny. I tell people all the time, they're like, Andy, you should really make the podcast shorter so that you know more people will listen and and it's easier to digest. And I'm like, yeah, but. How do you do that? I well, I can't. I don't want to do that. Yeah. I I guess you could do the Today Show and have a five minute story, and you could give the highlights of yours. But it's there's so much valuable juice. <laughs> there's so much valuable stuff in in each story. You know. Yeah. So, I don't think I've told this story like this. Right. So you'll have a nice piece of history. I don't know if anybody's going to listen to you it. Know, you will too. You could, exactly. You know, who knows what yeah. you could do with it. So, um, all right, cool. So we're going to cut now and then uh, there won't be any cut to the listener because it'll just go right to the next thing. Yeah, So great. So uh, we are back with Jimmy and uh, we've taken a two-day, 48-hour pause, rest. Um, not because we needed a pause, but, well, we did need a pause uh, just because of logistics in life. But now we're back on a Zoom conversation, a Zoom call, we were in person before, and uh, we're going to pick up where we left off, which we were right. We hadn't really gotten into the beginning of Evolution Fresh. We, we started about the technology. We had talked about the, the cold pressing. Uh, we c- talked quite a lot about that, but we, we hadn't, you know, the evolution of Evolution Fresh had not really come, come into play yet. Okay. Let's see. And certainly so, not the Starbucks part. Yeah, we hadn't gotten there yet. Um, let's see where we were at. I think um, 
I had jumped back in to evolution, started evolution fresh Mm -hmm. because I got out of the lettuce growing business, growing up organic, which was a couple of year non-compete. And then, um, and then saw what was happening out there with Odwalla naked and being owned by larger companies and make, they were making decisions to have, uh, you know, longer shelf life, but things generally speaking compromises from, from my perspective come with that. Um, when it well, comes we, to yeah, we, we went in quite a bit in the last time we we were talking about the quality issue and the the solution that you came up with the cold pressing based on the there was another product that you had cold pressed that was the idea behind it i don't remember what that was oh it was the yeah the costco buyer that had the guacamole yes yeah, yeah 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 um and so we talked quite a lot about that um previously yeah I think we were just about, uh, you know, basically Evolution Fresh. Uh, I mean, really, it was a small local company for many years. Uh, we were doing, you know, my passion around great juice, but we also were doing many other products as well. Oh, I didn't we know had that. we had trucks, distribution trucks going to stores, and. Um, you know, kind of the model of being profitable in the manufacturing and distribution business, you have to, you got to have a high dollar per drop. And, you know, one of the ways to achieve that is, well, there's many ways to do it, but what I, well, the way I was inspired to do it was have kind of venture out past juice. So juice was a very main focus, but we also went into fresh cut fruits Fresh cut vegetables, salsas, soups, salads, uh, you know, just amazing quality stuff that we were making ourselves, making fresh and then delivering the next day, just like our juices on our trucks. And um, so that was, you know, our plants where we made everything was this crazy place where fruits and vegetables came in the door one day and was shipped out the next, you know, in a new form, ready to eat, convenient form for people. So that was really the business for a long time. And we were growing that business. Jimmy, uh, when you, I didn't, a question I didn't ask you before, but when you got, when you started Evolution Fresh, was it because you had a big business goal in mind or you wanted to make money or you wanted to just give yourself more work to do or what was your, or you just felt like you wanted to bring quality into this juice business? Like what was your big reason why? I think it was a mix of things. I mean, for sure, I needed to make a living. Yeah. Uh, and then beyond that, it was just what it was always. It was just this passion for food and healthy food and just delicious nutrient dense authentic tasting food and um i only know i only really knew how to achieve that one way and that was really to make it you know ourselves make it and put it out there and share it with people so right. that was really the um the inspiration was just you know i've always just made my i make so many things at home from nut butters to sprouts to you know nut milks and it just I love doing it mm-hmm. and I and I make it and I share it and I it's one of my favorite things to do is to share it with people oh, so cool. cool yeah cool so All that's right. yeah evolution it would just became an extension of and you already knew how to do this business so it wasn't like you were starting from zero I wasn't starting over right uh, yeah it was just it was an it was an an evolution an ongoing process of what I was doing before. Yeah, right. Yeah. And I like I it, it, and also one of the big things I was seeing was uh, of the companies that were out there because that they, they were now owned with kind of a different business goal in mind of becoming, you know, Naked Odwalla becoming large uh, with selling everywhere and then you need a, a you know, a really long code life and just 
for me, the, 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 uh, the quality of the product was going downhill. So I saw a bunch of opportunity and people needed raise the bar to this amazing quality product. Right. Right. That's what, that's what it was about. And I, you know, and if I could taste it, vision it, know that it was, I wanted it and it was necessary for me. And there was a void in the marketplace for things that I liked. I just trusted and believed that there was a whole lot of other people that would appreciate that quality of level quality level of product being available. Right. Right. So that, you know, that was, it was pretty basic really. Cool. It wasn't a lot of market research or figuring out stuff. It was just like, this is needed. Right. Yeah. So, uh, evolution fresh there. It went, we, we, uh, started to grow. We, we got to the HPP part, right? Yep. The high power, high, is that a high power high, press? High pressure processing. High, high we, pressure we, process. we, we, we took, we bought one of these machines, raised money because it was a lot of money. Yep. We talked about that. Like yep. 10 or 12 million bucks to raise. Yeah. Um, we introduced this new category of juice. Did you have to teach your investors the technology before they'd be willing to like, what was that? What was that like? Cause you were introducing a brand new technology that nobody even, uh, nobody even knew what the heck it would do. Yeah. Nobody knew, but that was part of the intrigue. You know, yeah, it was right, like, right. we're, we're, we're going to disrupt yeah. what was going on out there. People knew this and we were going to, as far as I was concerned, dramatically raise the bar. Yeah. And the fact that we had a new technology, I mean, that's, that's generally speaking, I would think really intriguing for investors. Yep. You know, you have something new and exciting and no one else has it. Yep. So that was pretty. And was it protected but, to you for in any way? Like, could they have no. gone out once you did it? Could they have gone out and I'm guessing yeah. they probably have. Um, yeah. Yeah. People, other people do it. Yeah. You know, I mean, we didn't have any protection or no trademark or patent. No it's trademark not yours. You don't patents. Own it. Right. No, right. No, and that's okay. I'm, I've, I've been dealing with that my whole career. One good idea gets copied immediately. Yep. So you gotta, you just gotta stay on it and keep being innovative. Yep. Totally. Yeah. So, you know, we, t- we bought this machine, we raised a bunch of money, we hired new people, we got the, our juicery ready for it. We um, learned a whole bunch the first year that we put it in because we had to convert from what we were doing to this new technology, which was not easy. And uh, we did a bunch of sales calls and introduced it to the buyers and people were very supportive and excited and... Um, you know, and then, and then we did it. We actually, we started the process of this new category called cold pressed and our labels changed and, Mm -hmm. uh, we had this new mountain to climb and to educate consumers about who we were now. Mm -hmm. It was very different. So that was, uh, we were excited. The team was excited and we knew that, and you know, we, we, we gained code life, shelf life because of this technology without compromising quality. So our kind of our playing field got a lot bigger from, from what to what, what was the new old shelf life versus new? It was probably around, I want to say 25 days and it was going to go to 45 days. How'd you get 25 days out of a fresh product? Well, no, no, at that time, if you remember the story, the FDA had come in and mandated oh, right. Right. some sort of, we'll just call it Pas- pasteurization, pasteurization right yeah. now. Now I remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We talked about that too. Yeah. yeah. So... Uh, and we were choosing to do it where other people were getting 90 days out of really high heat pasteurization. We were choosing to do it a, a way that kept the integrity, mm-hmm. more of the integrity of the taste quality uh, 
And so we got a lot less code life than others. Yep. And then this new way, high pressure processing, just it's what it was. It was about 45 days and it didn't diminish taste quality or nutrient density at all. Did it, did it actually taste better than the, than the mm-hmm. product that was at the, the low level pasteurization? Yes, definitely. Huh. It was, a, it, it tasted like raw juice. Right. Right. So, so you, you know, raised the bar on your own product too. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. That's cool. We, just, we definitely did. Yeah. That's what was so exciting about it. Otherwise I one of, uh, went out and raised $12 million and had to sell half the company to do it. Right. So it was, the, the decision was quality based for sure. And then, uh, and then, you know, it was interesting. I didn't, you know, I'm not a coffee drinker. And, um, so I wasn't hanging out at coffee bars. Right. So I didn't really know Starbucks. Mm. That's really funny. And, um, <laughs> That's really it, funny. It's, it, it is funny because, but what, and this is this is a funny story because one of my original partners um, from San Diego, about two months before the story I'm about to tell you, he called me up and said, "You know, everywhere you where you're at in your life, you should read this book by Howard Schultz called Onward." I said, okay, you know, Howard Schultz, Starbucks, whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't really, didn't know much about him. I didn't know much about the company. So I read the book and I was truly inspired. I was, I was, uh, wow, this guy's a really, uh, like I can really relate to him as being a true entrepreneur that deeply had a passion for quality and basically his decisions were made from that place of, of quality. That's, that's what it appeared to me in yep. reading this book. And, you know, just, wow, he, uh, this big company, but these decisions that were being made, um, you know, in what I believed was coming from a good place and was driven from kind of like a humani- humanity-inspired kind of consciousness. Mm-hmm. Uh, I finished this book and I swear a month later I get a call from Starbucks. <laughs> Bizarre stuff, right? And and just so you remember, I had Naked Juice, I had sold to Jaquita, but I didn't I sold only 50% of it to Jaquita and it ended up and they said, you know, we're gonna fund your dreams, and that was their intentions, but it didn't end up going well because you know, big company Chiquita needed to make more money than we were making. And so they wanted to make decisions that I felt were compromising quality. And therefore we split paths. That was my only experience with big company. Right. So Starbucks calls me up and great guy, you know, was on the phone and said, can I come visit you? We're, we're interested in the wellness space. Uh, And, We've looked around at other juice companies, and you're on the list. And I said, sure, come come visit me. So he came down, and like a couple days later, he came down to our juicery, and uh, then we went out and had dinner. Great guy. I really enjoyed the time together. And then he said to me, uh, don't be surprised if you get a call from Howard Schultz in the next couple days. Well, the very next day, First thing in the morning, I get a call from Howard Schultz, and um, he's, you know, he introduced himself and he told me a little bit about what their interest is, and um, he, they're really interested in the health and wellness space, and they figured juice is a good way in, and um, he would love for me to come visit him. He was at his home. Uh, on the East Coast in the Hamptons. And um, so I get on a few planes and I'm, I have my juice with me and 
I mean, knowing how you are, Jimmy, and your your local, your kind of you like your Topanga Canyon. I'm, there's yeah. part of me that was expecting you to say, "No, you know, I don't really travel much." And <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, he he happened to be he was on he was recovering from something that he was going through for a few months, and he explained that and said, "You know, please come to my home." I'm on the East Coast, so yeah. I'm not traveling right now. So yeah, right, I said, right. sure, no, no, no problem. And, um, you know, and, and there was a part of it, of course, that was exciting. Yeah, right? of course. Yeah. And um, so anyway, I'm going to so I get my juice together and get on a few flights and end up at Howard, Schult- Howard Schultz's home wow. in the Hamptons. And, um, you know, and he greets me and uh, we spent... I don't know, five, six hours at his home and had a meal together and shared stories and uh, really just entrepreneurial-based stories. I got to hear his story about Starbucks. He heard my story about you know, my juice career. Uh, and I really tried to discourage him from being interested in a company like ours because I said, what we do is really difficult. You know, we're taking raw fruits and vegetables and pressing them and squeezing them and blending them. And, uh, you know, we have a short code life. You know, maybe you'd be more interested in a, co- a company like, kind of like a company like Naked Juice where they're, it's more of a, a blend factory where mm-hmm. they're, bringing in pre-processed juices and they're all they're doing is blending them and then pasteurizing and with really long code life and distributions easier. I said, what we do is crazy, difficult, uh, you know, and always having issues pop up. And, um, you know, after hearing, and I went into the details of how we achieve what we do. And, you know, after I was done, he's like, that's exactly what we're, what, what intrigues me. Wow. That, that's what we want. We want somebody that's emphatical about quality and that that's what the product is like. So, you know, by the end of that day, it sure seems like we had some common ground yeah. around taste quality and nutrient density and, you know, the, the, the passion, really the passion for quality and, um, and, you know, being entrepreneurs and where the decisions come from, mm-hmm. where the where 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 your decisions, how they get made. Yeah, the foundation, they're, they're, the why, the why behind the choices you make. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's it, it, you know my wisdom, my inner wisdom said, even though I had you know that other voice going, oh no 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 no, big company, they say one thing and do another. Right, right. I had that, but deeper than that, it was telling me this seems, this seems right. Hmm. You know, they really are going to be a partner and bring what they bring to the table. So the end result is amazing quality and share it with more and more people. Yep. So long story short, we make a deal. Uh, they acquire the company. Uh, part of that deal was they agree to build a hundred million dollar cold press juicery. Wow! Uh, state of the art, one of a kind in the world. Literally, one of a kind in the world. Nothing like it ever to date. And um, you know, and then of course, assist us in capital. And uh, people and knowledge, not juice knowledge, but yeah. you know, yeah. the knowledge they bring, they bring. So, I mean, it's been almost eight years now. And uh, amazingly, they have done everything they say they're going to do. And they, they have done everything they said they were going to do. They've been incredibly supportive. You know, we go to, I go to still health food store meetings and people go, Oh, Starbucks, you know, you're owned by Starbucks. And I go, you know, here's the story. Our quality of our juice is better today than it has ever been by, 
far. Hmm. I can't say any, you know, as far as the quality of the product, I can't say anything negative about this relationship. You know, they've done so much. They've given us the opportunity to use their scale and now our scale for good, which means we make product for Starbucks stores. So that gave us a lot of volume and that gave us the opportunity to buy our vegetables direct from the farms. Right. And I, and I told you about how fresh that product is. So yeah, right, right. all of that has been, has the relationship has achieved incredible juice quality. Hmm. And, you know, they've been really patient with us, uh, you know, because the the beverage industry it's it's a difficult space to make money in yeah and um so you 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 really got to be in it for the long haul in a sense and and they've they've been there and um and i still i'm still i'm still um feel like proud of some of the things they do mm-hmm. you know just in their world and uh, so I feel good about the partnership and I'm, 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 and I've been there for almost eight years. It's incredible. And they're, you know, they keep asking me to stay on and, and, you know, be the founder and be the chief juice officer and bring my passion to it. And so it's, it's been a great relationship. Well, I, I think it's really important what you said. Um, cause I think that we all might have that same struggle with the evil empire is is buying us out or i'm am i selling out to you know something that 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 uh might not lead to uh something that i'm passionate about right and and i think it's amazing and beautiful that it 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 has done everything you hoped it would do and more because you know if you're able to still get the level of quality like you said, as high as you have achieved, you could never build a hundred million dollar state of the art facility of your own. Um, no. you know, yeah. and, uh, the logistics I'm sure that has come along with dealing, you know, having a Starbucks behind you. Um, yeah. Well, and it's, it's, I love local companies, small local companies, uh, you know, generally speaking, they make great product. They're creative, they're nimble, they can move quickly. Bigger companies like us uh, maybe can't move as quickly and, you know, have to be careful how they do things, more careful. So I love the small local entrepreneur startup. Mm -hmm. Um, Eventually, they grow yep. and they go through some of the growing pains that I've gone through. And, um, you know, and eventually you end up, it's just, it's kind of generally speaking, the way it goes, you end up with investors because it's just to keep growing and stay ahead of it and stay competitive. It's just the nature of business. Mm-hmm. You need money to compete. Yep. So, uh, they've been, they've been, a, they've been a good partner, but you know, I, I, the point I was trying to make was it, there's, there's room for both going on. There's room for the, and there will always be the startup entrepreneur. The startup entrepreneur is who I am at heart. I think that's who Howard Schultz is at heart. Yeah. Right. Uh, right. You know, that passion for just creating yeah. and innovation. That's, that's what, those little companies is what drives bigger companies. Yeah. That's where the bigger companies get their ideas from. It's from the little companies. Right. right. They're the they're the innovators, the creative ones. It's it's a beautiful process in this business world how it works. Are so. you still engaged with Howard on a regular, somewhat regular basis? Is he how much involvement does he have? And do you engage with, with Starbucks? Like, is there a, are you guys, uh, operated as a completely separate company, um, inside of Starbucks? How does that work? Yeah. I mean, we, we're, we're definitely, uh, 
we're owned by Starbucks and we're a separate company within Starbucks. Uh, and we have a lot of, uh, connection and, um, you know, we can reach out and support to some really good people within Starbucks. So we're, and we sell products at Starbucks. So we're making products. So there's so much going on in, uh, between Evolution Fresh, the brand, and Starbucks. So there's, there's a bunch of interaction mm-hmm. all the time. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's good. It's, that, that's helpful. Are you and Howard on first name basis? Do you go out to the Hamptons and party with him and his family? And <laughs> no, he's really busy. <laughs> yeah, he's really busy. I'm busy, but we, we do make time. Uh, you know, maybe once a year or so that uh-huh. we'll we'll see each other and we'll sit down and catch up. Uh huh. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Well, the, you know, the last area that I always like to ask guests about, and this, you know, this is really kind of goes back to the heart of why you do what you do, but it is what do you, what are your non-negotiables? How do you run your day and run your life so that you can be on your game, clear, aware, healthy, um, of service to your family, to your friends, to your company? How do you, how do you do it? How do you make things work from your, I mean, and look from your schedule to your, you know, we can get into pretty much anything you want to. Yeah. Well, that's, I think as usually we would say, as we get older and wiser, but I'm just going to say, as we get wiser, (laughs) right. You know, because who knows, I think people are getting wiser at a younger age. Mm -hmm. I would want to believe. But I think as I have gotten wiser, uh, you know, kind of there, it's like a holistic, uh, approach to wellness. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not just cause I got pretty much dialed in the, the listening to my body, how I exercise, how I eat. I mean, there's some real specifics of them and, but how I eat, you know, the sleep I get, the yeah, I water hear, that I drink. Let's hear some specifics. I, I'd love to know. Like, what do you follow a certain diet? Do you? Um, yeah, you start I do. I mean, my diet. I I listen to my body, so I, I can't say that I've, I'm not, I'm I'm I like to believe I I'm flexible and I change when my body tells me to change. Uh, you know, right now I'm eating. I'm not eating any red meat right now and I'm not eating any chicken right now. Mm -hmm. I'm eating some fish and I'm eating a lot of vegetables and seeds and nuts and, you know, the more of the um, Mm plant-based with some fish thrown in there and that feels good for me. Uh, You know, I start my day off I don't usually eat until about 10 in the morning. I love, some people do really well. I'm one of them that do really well first thing in the morning on an empty stomach. Mm-hmm. Uh, like I don't, I don't know. I could probably go, I'm a, I have a pretty lean frame and so, mm-hmm. you know, I'm one of those guys that how we need to, need to be aware of. I need to get a certain amount of calories, but maybe not. But I'm just, my point is I, I love, uh, not eating in the morning. So my first meal is I, I make a pretty incredible smoothie for myself that has just all the packed with amazing superfoods. And are they fresh own. superfoods or do you use powders and stuff? The superfoods are generally powders uh, from green, you know, spirulina, chlorella to all kinds of reishi and different mushrooms and hemp and goji berries and have you ever written vodka. down your have you ever written down your recipe i've shared it with some friends that um would you be willing to share it with me and i can put it on the blo- on our blog let's be, talk that about a- that at the end of this okay yeah all right uh 
but it changes also. So right, I, it's, right. you know, I, I, it's got fresh nut milk in it that I make at home and oh, it's cool. always has yeah. kale and spinach and seasonal fruit in it. And then packed with superfoods and mm-hmm. it just gives me plenty, you know, and then I move into probably that's ra- around 10 30 in the morning and then probably around one o'clock in the afternoon, I'm ready for some snacks. I, I love apples and my fresh, my, my own fresh, I take raw organic nuts and seeds and I sprout them and I dehydrate them and I make nut butter out of them. So you sprout them by, you soak them in water overnight? I soak them for probably a, a minimum of 16 hours. Okay. And then I, uh, I'll dehydrate them. What is that? Why, why do you do that? Why can't well, you got to get the moisture out to make nut butter. Okay. Got it. Got yeah. It. Otherwise it won't turn into butter with, with the moisture in it. Do you use a dehydrator or do you yeah. use in the other? Yeah. Dehydrator? Just a basic dehydrator. You know, I mean, it goes from like 90 degrees to 150 degrees. You, you, it's like a super low temperature oven. Yeah. Right. It takes like a day and a half to dehydrate. And then, and why do you, it, why do you sprout? Well, sprouting, I believe, makes the seeds and nuts more digestible. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it's the same with beans. I mean, I always soak my beans for you know a day prior to cooking them. It's just, I really do believe it. I mean, there's some science behind it, but it basically makes it more digestible. Right, okay. Yeah. And then and, do, you, um, do you flavor your nut butters or do you just do? I like almonds? to put a little like Himalayan pink salt in it uh-huh. in, in the, in the water. Um, Cause I like, I like the flavor that it kind of just the right amount brings out the right amount of uh, the flavor of the seeds and nuts and a little salty is good. I remember trying to do, I don't remember if it was almond butter or cashew butter and I remember I had a blend tech at the time and I burned it up. I, it didn't kill the blender, but it has an emergency shut off. Yeah. You know, and so it, it suddenly it quit and I smelled this f- smell and I'm like, oh God, I think I killed my blender. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I never tried it again. I'm like, yeah, okay, can, this, yeah. this blender must not be made for that. Obviously, that's not true. That, you know, I, I don't think anyway. It must be, I, there's something I didn't do, but um, I don't know. I, have, I, I gave up. Yeah, you got to be careful. Do you it do is, it in a, do you do a, it in a blender? On, do you do it in a bl- do you do it in a blender? Is that how you do it? I do. I I do it in a uh, like a Cuisinart type of machine, like a food processor type. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, really? Huh. Yeah. I used to have a big uh, a big nut butter machine, and um, like one you find in um, like Whole Foods, like one of those suckers. Yeah, but not maybe a little bigger than that actually. Wow. Uh, yeah. Because I was doing uh, a little nut butter business at the farmer's market. Oh, cool. And um, so I, I kind of learned about it and, but that was too big for the home. So this is yeah. my, this is my home approach because I got addicted to, you know, once you do things at home, it's like making the nut milks. Yep. I mean, I make the nut milk. Once you go, once you taste that quality level, it's it's kind of difficult to go back if you have the choice. Right, right. And I make it a priority. I I like the kitchen. I hanging out there and making things, and I just it's enjoyable. It's meditative. It's enjoyable. Do you like doing working with raw foods more than you like actual cooking, or or? Or do you like them both equally? I like them both. I like. I think there's a place for the raw foods, and you know, but not overdo it. I'm not. Yeah. I'm not like a raw food right. advocate. I eat. I eat cooked food as well. Right. So it's okay. a it's a mixture. I mean, that smoothie is raw, and I eat plenty of raw vegetables and fruit throughout the day. With like right now, I'm on a hummus kick, but I don't really like the hummus for various reasons that you can buy in the market. So I've been making my own hummus at home, which is really delicious. And it's just chickpeas, tahini and, um, uh, yeah, my recipe is chickpeas, tahini, lemon, uh, you know, a little bit of that 
liquid from when you boil the the chickpeas, uh-huh. a little bit of cumin, a little bit of salt. I sometimes I put cilantro uh, in to finish it, or I put in uh, some parsley, mm-hmm. turn it green. I've never had green hummus. Well, yeah, I guess I have from Trader Joe's, but never yeah, made. I mean, I've made. You can hummus. do anything if you're making yeah. it at home. You can throw an avocado in there. Yeah. I mean, you can really do anything. But you know, so th- like the raw apple, I eat with the nut butter. The raw carrot or celery, I eat with the hummus. So it's it's a nice it's a new a nice food combination of these snacks. I eat. You know, I'm a big avocado person. I probably have two avocados a day. You know, there's there's walnuts around, there's pumpkin seeds, there's sunflower seeds, cashews, almonds, everything that I've, I've sprouted and made myself. Do you do uh, anything with the avocados or do you just eat them out of the, out of, right out of the fruit? I mean, we, we, the avocados go, uh, sometimes I'm in a, just this amazing company from San Francisco that makes bread for, I find it at Air One. I, it's just, just really just, you know, kind of um, gluten-free bread that's delicious. Hmm. And so sometimes I get in a bread mode where I'll put my avocado on just some avocado toast. Yep. Uh, avocado is always in salad. Uh, sometimes just straight avocado, avocado and the hummus. But what, a couple what, of avocados, you know, when you're eating. What's the name of that bread? Do you Do you remember – I'm forgetting right now. Okay. Some people are going to ask me. I'm sure. I know. It's, it's, <laughs> what it's was he talking about? Ex- I want the delicious gluten-free bread. <laughs> it is amazing. And I can only find it. I used to buy it straight from the company. Is it uh, refrigerated? Uh, Fran- is it refrigerated in the, in the market or is it on the non-refrigerated shelves? It's refrigerated. Refrigerated. Okay. Yeah. So that's a, that's a clue out there. If you want to find that bread, don't look in the... Yeah. And it's only in Air One. It's the only one place I found it. Otherwise, I was buying it direct. Right. So, but I go, you know, in and out of bread phases. Uh, and do you so, do you eat? So you eat at ten, and then snack in the afternoon, and then do you have like a larger dinner, or what's the pattern? Know, and no if pattern? I'm going to have protein, I like. I prefer. It doesn't always happen this way. I love to have my protein in the afternoon. You'll know, call it late lunch, mm-hmm. two, three o'clock. Uh, I'm going to have a piece of fish, but I'm always eating the nut seeds and the hummus. And so if I don't get some type of seafood, seafood, it's maybe twice a week. Otherwise, I, I do really well on vegan protein sources that I'm you know, the, the beans, nuts, seeds, and I seem a little bit of tempeh. Mm-hmm. Uh, I do just fine. But you're not, it sounds to me like you're not a def- definitive vegan. Like you, you, you eat a lot of vegan foods, but you, you still eat right. fish and you, you'll have, you'll, you'll poke around in other areas. I'll poke around. I'd say a year ago I was enjoying meat. I was, uh, I was shopping at this I keep forgetting the names but there was a there was a on, in Santa Monica there was a grass finished butcher Was it on Wilshire was it the yeah. uh, there's a restaurant yes. Are they in a restaurant yes. Yeah yes. Oh god the name yeah. just popped it starts with a B Um I love their I've I've eaten at the restaurant I've never gone to the butcher yeah, so the butcher, I mean, it's just, yeah, I mean, it's or, it's organic and it's grass-finished. And those, you know, so I'm, I don't like uh, that industry. Yeah. More of what, how they deal with the, the animals and how they treat them and the, the antibiotics that they Bel, feed Bel, them. I'm, I'm Campo. totally not into that. Bell Campo. Campo, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, but they're, they're, they're meat. So I was eating, I was eating that meat probably once every three weeks and mm-hmm. feeling good about it. But then I got, I don't know what happened. I was at a restaurant and ate a piece of beef and it 
something happened and I haven't eaten beef since then. There you go. <laughs> and I, but I feel great. So, I right. mean, I, right. I, I, I have no plan on when I'll change. I just, I just listen to my body. I right. really do. Right. I'm, and I, and I, I'm like, I, I, you know, you and I, we know about the divine unknowing, mm. right? And the yeah. divine unknowing is I'm pretty open to what's coming. Well, I think, that intuitiveness is first of all i think it's a cultivated practice like you learn it's something you have to kind of cultivate and learn maybe some people don't but i certainly have and it's not always it's it's because i think a lot of times it, it's not that it's not very loud you know and you have to slow down enough and quiet down enough in order to and pay attention in order to find it and hear it and being, and then be willing to listen, you know, cause it might not yeah. tell you what you like. You were willing to listen to that voice that said, go sell juice on the beach. Not everybody would do that, you know? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so paying attention and then following it is really um, a practice. Well, and you know, that's what's guiding my life these days. I mean, that, that, that inner wisdom it's it's not a concept anymore. At right. at some point it was a concept. It was like, oh, I hear people talking about it, you know, people I'm listening to this little YouTube or this video on it and you know, people are speaking from their perspective about inner wisdom and ways of being more fulfilled and happy, but where I come from these days is I really am in touch with uh, well, we'll use the word authentic self. I, I really am in touch with who I am, you know, my, my core, my groundedness, my authenticity. I really am in touch with that. And, and, and it's become just, a lot more fluent to listen to inner wisdom and that be the guide uh, of, of my life and the steps that I take and why I do what I do. It's no longer a, like a practice or a technique or going outside of myself to, it doesn't mean that I'm not always learning and still listening and provoked by other people and interaction there's just a, there's a real um, kind of inner, I can hear, I, I'm in touch and I can hear my inner wisdom. And not all the time, I get, I get as thrown off as all of us do and confused and um, kind of listening to that chattery other, you know, some people call it the ego, but that, 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 that other voice that is, um, you know, that probably isn't serving us very well. And I, and I know the difference. I, I really know the difference. And when I get caught up in that place within, I know well enough now to kind of take my foot off of the gas pedal in a sense. Mm -hmm. When I'm finding myself engaged in the wrong place within, or the wrong place with, you know, in my intellect, my ego, my intellect, I'm just, my inner wisdom says, disengage, take the foot off the gas pedal of, of that energy, that fear based stuff, or things are way more fluid and simplistic. And I think the result of that is I'm, I'm a happier person today. My relationships are better. Um, I, I, f I flow the river. I can feel the flow of the river. I really can. I can feel the flow of the river, the, the incredible limitless flow of wisdom. I mean, it is, it, it's an incredible word that, this design of what we get to live is, you know, it's, it's, it, it truly is incredible. Uh, 
I mean, we can get in a whole other discussion, but I don't know we, we can go there of, of really what I'm into these days. Cause you know, I went to, yeah, so I went to USM and that was the spiritual psychology school. And these days I'm, I'm studying something called the three principles. Mm-hmm. And, um, this really has impacted my life greatly in a beautiful way. And it's very simplistic. Uh, and it's really meaningful. And it kind of, it, it's, it's, it's not techniques and strategies. It's just, it's just an understanding about how the human experience is created moment to moment. Hmm. So us as, we're all the same, all of us as humans, how our human experience is unfolding and created moment to moment, and it's happening within. It's not happening from the outside in. It's happening from the inside out. And it's, you know, once you, once you get a little feel and grasp, you start to understand that it's all internal. All the, you have all your inner, you have all your inner resources within. Mm -hmm. You don't really need to go seek and find outside of you. But there's great like the whole life challenge. I mean, you know, any things that they're really pointing people to, to look inside yeah. because that's where the answers are. Right. And I guess I have, I have um, found more and more of that in, in, in within and, and trust that and understand it, that the answers are within. Are the three principles a, is it a book? Is it a philosophy? Is it a is it a program somewhere? What I, I know you said it's not a program. What, what um, are there any yeah, more it, hooks or anchor points or website or something? Uh, well, there's a guy named Sidney Banks that I think in the '70s he was the he came across kind of had a download and you know he he he. Uh, he he was a welder with a ninth grade education and um, it just changed his life. And he became kind of like, uh, I I don't think he would ever like the word a guru of some sort, but he, this, this understanding that he came in into contact with, and then he just started sharing it with psychiatrists and psychologists and, it's just now it's a worldwide community. So I think if, I mean, one of the um, 3pgc.org is a, uh, it's one of the global, I think it's 3principlesglobalcommunity.org. Okay. Okay. That's a great resource just to start poking around. But there's there's lots of books and, I mean, you can just, Look it up, you know, three principles. Okay. The, the three principles and Sydney Banks. And it just, it's a world, it's a, literally a worldwide community. And I think um, it's something that's has taken me, uh, has intrigued me. And I've been studying it now for a couple of years. Now, I know you said you're, you're, um, you don't have, you don't have to do any practices to feel this flow, this river of this wisdom. But I wonder if you do have any regular practices, whether it's meditation or yoga or, or things that are, would fit in the category of well-being that you engage in on a regular basis just to keep yourself where you are. Oh, yeah. I mean, I start the day with a hike. Mm-hmm. And we're lucky enough to live in Topanga Canyon. And, uh, you know, I take a hike with my wife and it's a great time to just be out in nature and to connect, you know, cause we know how busy we all are and yeah. to find time with your, whoever your partner is. Um, so we, we start our day and it's usually fairly early. We take an hour hike, uh, like before and, dawn, like that early or, you yeah, know. like, I mean, it depends on how cold it is, but in the summer we got to, you know, be on the trail by six thirty. Oh, cool. cool. Uh, you know, maybe in the winter by seven thirty, mm-hmm. and, um, you know, so, and 
I have my own yoga practice. Well, I would call, I wouldn't even call it a yoga practice. I have my own movement practice that I do three to four times a week. Uh, I mean, I love classes and gyms and, uh, but I'm also, I'm fairly busy and kind of isolated up in Topanga. So I've created some movement exercise for myself. So I definitely stay fit. Mm -hmm in movement and because i know that if i don't i will get stiff and you know things won't my physical body won't work so well so i i enjoy my physical body feeling good Mm -hmm. therefore i definitely have movement practices uh so yeah movement practices and i had i had more of a uh meditation practice i used to meditate every day uh, and I and I and I totally endorse meditating uh, and allowing. I needed. I kind of needed it more before I kind of had the 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 understanding of the three principles. I don't. I don't need it at all anymore. It's still a great um, fun thing to do. Mm-hmm. Just just to sit and watch life happen and come through me and uh but i don't need it at all anymore so i guess the belief that i needed it and kind of felt like i needed it before i used to do it a lot more now i i meditate when i kind of feel like it like i i I was in a i took a meditation course and actually an online meditation course that lasted a year where the group would meet once a month for an all day retreat, you know, online. So think, yeah. Online. Wow. What is yeah, it? Was, You'd meet it, online. It was unbelievable. Wow. It was, there was, there was 800 people doing what? it. Wow. Yeah, it, was, it was two. I mean, it's amazing what you do online these days, right? There was two teachers and like a video. Were, was it a video thing like we're doing now or no, no, no video. We were, it, you just listen uh-huh. and um, they were, teaching and talking and then you'd you know it was probably for seven hours and of each hour you would half of the time would be you'd be in meditation practice the other part of the hour you'd be the teachers would be talking and there was some questions so it was beautiful so anyway there's there's beautiful work that gets done uh that involves meditation Mm -hmm. i just have less of the need to meditate these yeah. days. Yeah. And do you, um, how about your sleep practice? Do oh, I love anything? sleep. I love yeah. getting, my wife teases me. Uh, I like eight hours of sleep. Huh. I just like it. It feels good. I so wake do you up, have an early bedtime? Yeah, I get, bed, to, like I get to bed by 10. 10? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, you know, 10 to... Six is wonderful. Yep. You know, 10 to 5.30, 10 to 6 is usually probably how I roll, 10 cool. to 6. Cool, cool. Yeah. Are there any other – oh, what, what about recreation? Do you surf? Do you, uh, do you play a sport? Do you, um, you know, like I know you hike, but do you have any other recreational things you do? Well, one of my loves is we were lucky enough that we bought uh, we bought a home on 11 acres of land and down in Costa Rica. So we go down there two, three times a year, and I surf down there. That's where I surf because right. the water's warm. Right. So I love to surf. I just love the you know just that clean, warm, fluid interaction with the ocean is just. Amazing. Well, and you're up to something, right? That you, that yeah, you to- yeah. I'm looking at. I'm, I, I can't say that I'm doing it yet, but I'm. I'm really inspired to on this land, this gorgeous piece of land um, that over that sits above the jungle and overviews the ocean uh, and the mountains. I want to. I want to create some t- type of wellness center. Cool, cool. So where people can come and learn and 
be inspired and find their own inner wisdom within. Mm -hmm. So that's my make. That's really my main inspiration is just sharing wellness within, and it's so there for people. And you know, they just sometimes we just don't see it. We get caught up. We just get caught up, and we don't understand how it works. So once we understand just you know a few pointers here and there about how it act, how our experience is being created. We tap in there, and and uh, you know we can do we can do more with it. We can once once we're uh, once we're tapped in, you know it affects everything we do. Right, right, yeah. And you you said also uh, that you're doing quite a I don't know if it's quite a lot, but you're coaching now also, right? You're yes, yeah. That's one of my favorite things to do. So I'm a a. I'm a life coach. I have, uh, this is where I should probably, should make myself available to people. <laughs> well, yeah, just, but, so, they, just to let people in on the conversation you and I had was, you know, I, asked, I sent you an email asking you for some pictures and your social media handles and your bio and you're like, what? Well, I don't do that. <laughs> I mean, they, I, I'm summarizing, you know, something yeah. else. But, uh, and I'm like, well, Okay, that's fine. I, you know, but yes, if you are looking for clients, it'd be good for people to know how to find you. Yeah, somehow the clients, you know, they, they, they do don't saying you. they just appear when totally. it's when the time is right. So, uh, yeah, I have, I love, I love that. That's we my, my, actually my wife and I we do it together. Some of our clients are couples uh, because we've been to through it all mm-hmm. and being married for 25 years and uh, you know so much great stuff just to share so much positivity how a relationship can actually thrive after 20 years of marriage when you think wow you know we've there's not much more that we can uh experience that's uplifting but so we we do that and then i have business clients that i love you know because i i i I've been in business forever and I love touching people through business. Yep. Uh, yep. And just the typical person who is not in business and not in relationships. So all of the above, my coaching is it's it's uh it's very fulfilling. That's that's amazing. It's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Well, Jimmy, thank you for uh taking the time to tell this story. I know it's not something you've done <clears throat> ever maybe this way well, not this way yeah um i i just think there's so much good stuff in in the story i mean in some of the logistics of the story but then but in how you a lot of the decision making you made and your 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 inner wisdom and your willingness to follow your own instincts and to stick with what you know what you wanted what you know you you really achieved your vision um in spite of some of the bumps along the way you know yeah that's 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 a good way to say it just kind of waking up each day and kind of putting our best forward uh that's the way it's been for many many years yeah it's cool and a lot you know and, and a deep learning along the way you know and a humility right you got it there's a humility that is so helpful in life because a lot of this is bigger than us anyway. Sure is. <clears throat> it sure yeah. is. Well, um, again, thank you. And I really appreciate you taking the time and to be on the show, especially when you've got nothing in this. I mean, you've got no, you're not promoting this. You're not promoting yourself. You're, you can't even reach you. <laughs> so, <laughs> you are unreachable. It's fantastic. You're the only guest I've ever had that's unreachable. It's fantastic. I love it. All righty. Well, <laughs> it's uh, you're a, you're a great buddy, and um, grateful to you for bringing this to the world. You know, you're you're obviously finding some really cool things to share, and just. Um, yeah, anyway, you're you're a great guy. So I wanted to I, I I mainly wanted to do this to support you. Thanks, Jimmy. Thank you. Yeah. 
Hey, it's Andy, and thanks so much for listening. If you want to know more about what I'm learning each month, head over to andypetronic.com and subscribe to my monthly newsletter. If you were touched, moved, or inspired by anything you heard today, chances are someone else you know would be too. Please take a moment to think about who and send them a link to this episode. And if you're super stoked, please head over to iTunes to write a review. The best way to keep current on guests and episodes is to subscribe so that the latest one will automatically get delivered straight to your phone. The apps I use for this are Apple Podcasts, Overcast, or Pocket Casts. The Andy Petronic Podcast is produced by our team, Winslow Jenkins, Becca Borowski, and Ernie Hurtado. Big thanks to Nikki Grudadaria for the artwork. You can find all of our episodes, links, and complete show notes at wholelifechallenge.com forward slash podcast. I'm Andy Petronic. Thanks for listening.